Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we're talking with Dr. Jean Morasso, a professor of medicine and the director of the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, who will share her personal experience confronting health equity issues while living her, in her community and caring for patients during the pandemic. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Dr. Morazzo, I know in Birmingham area, you've got snow for the first time in a long time, uh, but I want to talk to you today about your experience of being in this community and being an infectious disease physician caring for for patients in the middle of a pandemic. And I know that you're deeply committed to health equity. So when you look at your daily clinical work through a health equity lens, what do you see? Todd, thanks. It's great to be here. And it is great to ask this critical question because when you look at the disparities in outcomes with COVID, I think history is going to judge us very, very harshly. And the issue is that the access to healthcare and to the best healthcare has such a long history of discrimination and putting people in a position where they were already at great disadvantage to access the best quote unquote health care possible. You add on that a pandemic, you add on that social isolation, you add on to that physical barriers to getting in, and you're asking people to do telemedicine on top of it. You can imagine that it, these have added up and really exponentially uh, impacted the experience of our most vulnerable patients. So it's been really hard. Yeah, that uh, I'm curious about, you know, history will judge us harshly. It's in some respects, you're saying like, We've known these have existed for a long time, and we should know that, you know, faced with a pandemic, it's going to exacerbate that problem. Is there any yeah. other thing we, you know, that you, you know, I, mean, I guess I would just say, to put it in context, you know, people who like health equity like to do infectious diseases. HIV is a great example because pathogens, infectious pathogens are fantastic at taking advantage of our most vulnerable cracks in society, right? Whether it ha is happening during migration, war, homelessness, unprotected behaviors that vulnerable people engage in, all those things. So to me, the pandemic is just an example of it writ large, where you know it really has taken advantage of the people who have the least access to healthcare. On top of that, there are some indications that there are, of course, all these comorbidities, and that really set people up for the worst outcomes of, of COVID. So just to set the stage, you've got a bunch of people who lack access to consistent, fantastic health care, who have a lot of comorbidities, who've been escalating for really generations. And this is a generational problem, a societal generational problem. And on top of that, you give them a disease that not only forces them to have it in social isolation, but preys on their biological comorbidities. So it's a recipe for disaster, and indeed it has been for our patients. Yeah, it's a shame that it took a, a pandemic to kind of shine a spotlight on what we knew was already there. I mean, for you, you moved from the West Coast to the South here in an entirely new community and a new culture in this transfer. Can you talk about the health equity considerations in the context of your transition? Sure. So I actually just had my five-year uh, anniversary of my move from Seattle, so I actually feel a little bit more legitimate talk talking about these things now. You know, health equity is everywhere. Um, I, I don't want to paint it as a problem, particularly of the Deep South. I think what is so different here is to me, again, coming from the metropolitan area of Seattle, where we have lots of people who are living without a home, lots of people who are dealing with substance use challenges, tons of people. I mean, I worked in the county hospital there, so there was no shortage of people who had experienced all the worst outcomes of being marginalized. I think the difference here, at least in the Deep South, from what I've seen, is that the systemization of rural poverty is so linked to uh, people who have been in racial groups that have been disenfranchised for generations, right? When you look at the voting history, the civil rights history, the land ownership history here, the education history here, you know, it hasn't been that many generations since we ex ex accepted black physicians at University of Alabama at Birmingham. Now we have a uh, fantastic African-American dean, so thank goodness for progress. But but the systemization, I guess, of, of poverty that is embodied in even what we call the Black Belt, which is the geographic area south of Montgomery, so-called because of its agricultural soil and history, um, demographically now one of the poorest 
um, and worst health health outcomes areas in the country. So it's different. It's more systematic in a way that you just don't see in some urban settings that I've worked in. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned, you know, the, your experience coming out of Seattle. Um, you know, how, you know, how did you originally become interested in health equity? And, you know, should this be something that's part of every physician's training? How do we do that? Absolutely. It should be part of every physician's training because, you know, physicians and most physicians in training are very privileged people. You, you've come from a background, even if you fought to get to where you are, you know, you still have a set of gifts and you have a set of support systems that manage to get you here. I think it's easy to forget along the way that most of your patients, uh, many, let's just say, if not most of your patients, don't have anything near uh, the privilege that you've had. And I think it's this recognition of systemic sustained privilege um, that we've been talking about more in a different way. We've seen it through the lens of race hugely in the last year, of course. Um, but, you know, it's been operative in, in many, many kinds of settings. I mean, I think my original entree into this space, of course, was with HIV AIDS when I was a young trainee. It was very clear that not only were young gay men and older gay men, but clearly gay men being, you know, devastated and had been marginalized for obvious reasons, but also I trained in New Haven, uh, Connecticut, and it was really affecting particularly young black women who were partners of injection drug users, partners of bisexual men. So I think that really woke me up uh, in a way that I, I kind of knew about, but experiencing that firsthand with patients is always a huge wake up call. Mm -hmm. And we've seen, you know, the impact of those kind of uh, structural issues and biases that people bring in. You know, if you look at the stats, on uh, how that impacts then uh, black population or even you know LGBTQ patients, uh, you know that's pretty significant. Um, you know how how do we fix you know these cracks that we've seen in our healthcare system that you know the pandemic has really shown a spotlight on? Do you have any sense of like you know steps we can take to fix those problems? So speaking as uh, someone who thinks a lot about this, I think we need more people who look like the people we're trying to serve. Um, there is no way that um, someone like me is necessarily going to have automatic credibility going to a church in Birmingham and trying to discuss vaccine hesitancy with the congregants when it's not, I'm not one of them. Now that's not to say I don't do that. I'm not going to do it. I am doing it uh, because I want to try, but having, having role models and leaders, uh, I just saw this great documentary, black men in white coats, which is really, really cool. I mean, that power of that is inestimable. I know some young uh, black uh, bisexual gay men in our HIV clinic we have a single uh, young black female provider there. They will not see anyone else but her. And I think that, again, this concept of you look like me, you talk like me, maybe you don't talk like me, but you understand me um, is, is inestimable. Just to see someone up there or across the table from you um, or on the video screen or on any screen is we can't, we really can't emphasize that enough. And so getting people who look like those people that we really want to take care of in front of the camera, in front of the room, in front of leadership, um, I think that's just incredibly critical. And that pipeline has not been developed as much as we would like. I mean, there is a big gap. I mean, if we look at, you know, in terms of U.S. population, approximately 14 to 15 percent of the population being black and for you know, doctors and medical students, it's yeah. under five percent. Yeah. So that's a that's a long term fix. What do we you know What can we do now? It is uh, a long -term in the meantime. Fix. It is a long term fix. I don't know if you've been hearing about some recent discussions uh, with some uh, schools in New Orleans. Actually, there's this week a lot of discussion about how you quote unquote rank and decide who should get into residency. And traditionally, that's been a very pedagogical logical exercise, right? I mean, you look at people's, I mean, traditionally, and you, you look at people's school, you look at their curriculum record, you look at this, you look at their letters, that system is rigged. Um, it's really rigged against people who might go to historically black colleges. It's rigged against people who might go to medical schools. Remember the Flexner report actually got rid of black 
medical schools. So can you imagine the generational impact that has had on the ability of young black people to train? I mean, they lost out on two generations, right? So when you're scoring people on these metrics that are really regressive, um, you know, you, you just don't really get the whole picture. And I'm guilty myself. I mean, when I look at fellowship applications for infectious diseases, you know, I can tell who I think, oh, I, I really want to talk to this person. And then I'll talk to somebody who maybe did not check all those boxes. And I'm like, wow, I can't, I would not have like ranked this person first on my list to interview. But so all these expectations, all these metrics that we have, again, it's implicit bias and explicit bias. I mean, some of it's explicit, like, oh, they went to that great medical school. Oh, I know that person who wrote that letter. He's a good friend of mine. Um, that's explicit. And then implicit is just like, oh, this person sounds cool and I think I know I would be comfortable talking to them. So we've got to break those down and think about how we encourage people to get through our systems um, and succeed, succeed in our systems. That's the main thing. That's incredibly important. Um, what did, what is your advice for health care organizations now? You know, what what strategies can they adopt to improve health equity? I think they can walk the walk. There's a lot of talk right now, right? All these places are developing policies. They're naming chief diversity officers, equity officers. I think those are first steps, but if you don't do the hard stuff and follow up with the meaningful actions that increase representation in the C-suite um, or in the dean's office or whatever you want to call it, then it's not going to help. You're not going to have young people who um, need to get in those positions say, wow, um, that 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 person is now the CEO of the hospital and I, maybe I want to do that or that person's the dean. Um, maybe I want to do that. Other person's the chief of surgery. You know, I can, sh she's the chief of surgery. I can do that. So I think um, I, I worry that there is a lot of sort of piling on um, in an effort to look like um, we're doing the work, but the work is hard. You know, it's uh, it's uncomfortable. There are there are a lot of things that come up where uh, people say you're not doing enough. You're not really listening to me. You're paying. You know, I'm you're, you're giving me lip service, but you're not really doing the work. So I think you have to be open to discomfort um, and really get people in there who maybe aren't saying what you want them to hear. And uh, I don't think healthcare organizations always like that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for individual physicians about? how to do their part to advance health equity? I think it's important to think about your comfort zone and if you and to recognize what makes you uncomfortable. Maybe it is talking to uh, someone whose educational background is not similar to yours. I mean, that actually happens a lot. It's surprising, but it does happen. And maybe it's a discomfort you don't even recognize. You know, you just assume that person is not as smart as the resident you're working with who is a graduate of blah, blah, blah. And that that is a really dangerous uh, area. Or maybe you're not comfortable talking with a young man who's trying to tell you that he's having sex with other men and at risk for HIV. So, you know, there are these alarm bells that go off in your mind and you sometimes just want to not listen to them. Important to listen to them. And if you're uncomfortable, talk about it. Not to the person, necessarily the patient, but think about talking about it with your peers, maybe somebody who can really help you about that. So the first step, I think, is just self-recognition of our biases, whether they're subtle or whether they're not so subtle. And again, I'm as guilty as anyone. So that's so much of the reason why I've <laughs> been thinking about this, because it's so easy. We are a product of our culture. We're a product of our environment. We're a product of our training. So um, it's a challenge, but we've got to work hard. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Maraza. I really appreciate you being here today and sharing your perspective with us. That's it for today's COVID-19 update. We'll be back with another segment tomorrow. For resources on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us today. Please take care.